Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Rising to fame in 2004 with his debut album, Back to Bedlam, which sold over 11 million copies, our guest tonight has topped the music charts around the world. Having told the Sun newspaper that you have to be a brave, brave person to admit that you are a James Blunt fan. I know we're all very excited to have him here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Blunt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi there. Hey. Hey. Thanks very much, John. <laughs> Go on then. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hey, well, thanks so much for having me. No, thanks so much for coming today. It's your first time in Cambridge, you said? It is, but it's been a long time since when I offered a free dinner, so I thought I'd drive out from London and hey, no worries at all. I mean, take you up on your offer. Yeah, no one, no one said it was free, but um, in any... <laughs> <laughs> you spend the formative years of your life growing up at Harrow School. Um, how did boarding school affect your experience of, of growing up, um, and what were you like? Um, I took to being beaten and, and rogered pretty like a duck to water. <laughs> um... And, yeah, I think um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think, you know, you, you, we, I was still there at the time of fagging, um, which just means that I uh, had a senior, when I arrived, I was, you know, as the junior boy, I had a senior boy in the top year who I didn't know his actual name. I was only allowed to refer to him as God. Uh, and I had to go and wake him up in the morning, open his curtains, bring him tea, um, coffee, change his sheets, and, uh, and he would, on the weekends, give me cigarettes and alcohol. Um, and it was a fantastic r relationship. And then after... <laughs> Uh, and when I, when I was in the top year, he came back to school, and I just didn't know how to refer to him other than God. <laughs> you know, hey, God, how are you doing? <laughs> so anyway, I haven't heard from him since, but it was a, it was, it was a special time. So, you, <laughs> so you've lost your connection with God. Um, were, you, were you popular in general? Did you, were you sporty? Were you musical? Because you didn't always intend to go into music. Yeah, I mean, I did take up music, but, um, but no, I'm a smaller man, so I have small man's disease, Napoleon complex, so I'm quite pushy and punchy, so I, so I knew I was going to join the army, and, and I liked, uh, you know, tennis, and I can run forever, which is really boring, cross-country running is the most boring sport in the world, mm. and, and I hated it, and unfortunately I could do it, but I did always uh, know that I wanted to do music, um, again, because I'm small, and how else are you going to impress girls, um, and, uh, and so, yeah, and so I, that's what I said I was going to do. So you, you said that you know you wanted to go into the army. Your family has a history with the army that dates back to the 10th century, is that right? Yeah, um, uh, so I'm told that yeah. um, my original name is LeBlond, blonde-haired um, Vikings from Denmark um, uh, related to King Gorm, um, who was not Gormless. Exactly. <laughs> And leaving school, uh, you joined the army for... You were obliged to join for four years, and you stayed for six. Um, yeah, how, how was that? Yeah, so, um, so the army... I don't know if they still do it, but the army do an amazing thing where, because uh, the parents, or, you know, father in my case, are, are, are travelling and are moving around, and we spent time in Germany, Hong Kong, Cyprus, um, as far uh, abroad as Yorkshire, um, uh, then because of that movement, then the army pays for your, uh, for your schooling. So, so that they subsidized um, Harrow School, and, and, and then I got a bursary. So, so I did owe the army uh, money, and that's how I ended up um, uh, joining them. You can pay the army back that money, um, but who, uh, how many of you, by the end of your student times here at Cambridge, are going to have the money to pay back to whoever, whichever employer? You're kind of stuck. Um, so I'd, I was signed up for four years, and I ended up doing six because I really enjoyed it. It was an amazing experience. And what was your role in the army? Um, I ended up as a captain um, in the House of Cavalry, the lifeguards, which is a reconnaissance regiment. So um, my, my uh, specialist training is to creeping around in bushes, no. uh, which I've taken on into my music career <laughs> as well. And I know where most of you live. Uh, and, uh, and it was an amazing, it's an amazing job, really, where, where uh, I suppose, you know, you have guys who go out with guns, and, and, and I would go out instead with the laser um, and point it at people and, uh, and fire my laser at people, and then aircraft would come down and, and follow the, the laser and drop their bombs on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just let that, let that sink in. <laughs> um, one of the things that I have read is that whilst you're serving the army, yeah, you strapped your tank, or you strapped your gu um, you strapped your guitar to the outside of your tank in yep. Kosovo, which is a very poetic and a picture scene. Um, were you always interested in music? I mean, why did you have a tank and a guitar in Kosovo? 
<laughs> yeah, uh, well, I was given the tank. I bought the guitar. No. <laughs> um, and, and I strapped the guitar to the outside because I wasn't allowed to strap the soldiers to the outside. <laughs> Um, and, and I really wanted to look after that guitar and stick it on the inside, but now I was told it, that it didn't fit, so I stuck it on the outside. Everyone, when you're going, you know, it's a weird thing when you're sent off to war. You're going to war, and what are you going to take? And so you take, you know, your, um, your, uh, all the things that you're going to need to protect you, your helmet and your body armor, and, you're gonna, and the things that you're going to need um, to, to attack, like, you know, weapons and the ammunition, but then you're going to think you're going to have a lot of downtime, and so everyone thinks, what am I going to take? A pack of cards are, is really useful. Someone's going to take that and a, and a football, and, and then some annoying person brings a guitar mm. um, to sing, you know, all we're saying is give peace a chance um, in whichever war zone. And, and in fact, my guitar that was strapped to the outside of my uh, tank, I've just found it up in the attic uh, about a week ago, um, uh, because it survived. 1999, Kosovo, uh, uh, with all, all of the, the action that we saw, and it was a pretty amazing experience. Um, and, and it survived, and it came back in one piece. And then as I was trying to get a record deal, I, I went out um, and I was uh, recording demos for EMI Music, and it went really well. And they said, hey, you know, you're going to be a star one day. And I, and I left them. And I put my guitar over my back. And I had a, a motorbike. Um, because again, I'm a smaller man trying to impress girls. <laughs> uh, and so you get the theme. Uh, and so I put my guitar over my back. And I climbed over my socking great motor guzzi V11 sport silver thing. I looked for the first time in my life. I looked cool. And, and I revved it with all of EMI watching. And I revved it. And at one mile an hour, I fell over. <laughs> And I smashed the indicator, the mirror, and I smashed the guitar. Mm -hmm. and, and then the bike was so heavy, I couldn't lift it up. <laughs> so they all had to lift it up for me. And, and they, were, they were laughing their heads off. And, and I was laughing on the outside, but in the inside, I was crying. And I drove around <laughs> the corner. I drove around the corner, and I stood off, stood off the guitar. I stood off the motorbike. thought, oh, you prick. <laughs> um, and anyway, I wasn't signed by EMI Music. <laughs> signed to Warner. <laughs> did, your, did your experience in the army change you massively? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Were you expected to go into the army as well? Was yeah, it yeah, very much. I was, well, no, you know, I was just showing the army. I think parents just show you what they know, don't they? You know, parents want you to just have a good life, a happy life, a safe one, and so parents just introduce you to whatever they know. Um, and so, uh, so my dad introduced me to the army, and, and also knowing that your father's done something is a, is a great way of accessing it, because you know that if he can get into it, something like that, of course I can get in. Any exam he's going to do, I can do that. Uh, and so it was just a path um, that I followed. And, and yeah, and, and, uh, um, and it's definitely worthwhile. I'm in the music business now, but the music business is really hard work. Um, and despite what you read in the magazines, there's a lot of graph that goes on, and, and it was really useful to be after university, I just was, you know, life was easy. I, I had six hours a week of lectures. I don't know how, maybe at Cambridge you have more. Um, but I finished in sociology uh, and uh, with, a, with a Desmond. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, my wife doesn't even know that. She, I think I lied to her about what degree I have. because. <laughs> <coughs> Um, and, and so the army was very good at kind of getting you back up to speed, where life is not about six hours a week. Life is, you know, maybe it's more than 36 hours. It's, it's a hell of a lot. It's, uh, and, and the music business, if you want to get anywhere, you've got to work. Yeah. So how do you find yourself selling over 20 million records of one song alone? So going from the army to, to going where you are today? I wrote, you're beautiful. <laughs> so... <laughs> Just to fill people in, uh, James's Twitter bio says one song is all you need. <laughs> um, what else was there? Because there is actually deep down more than just one song. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you, you don't even believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Rolling Stones are still, still looking for that song. Yeah. Makes me kind of smug. Um, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, well, I suppose, uh, to, I don't know if any of you are trying to get into the music business in, in any way, um, but, it's, uh, but it's, there's one person over there. You are, aren't you? <laughs> okay, you are. No. Um, okay, well, I'm in it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just a really weird thing of uh, getting in because 
because you know, I just didn't know anyone in the music business, and it's a really tough industry. And presumably, it's some of you are in the third year and thinking, what the hell am I going to do afterwards? And it's, uh, it's incredibly hard to, to find your way without people in that business, without a, a friend, a parent, a relation in some way. And so I was doing gigs, inviting record companies down, and, and they simply weren't interested. It, because at the end of the day, you, you're no good at telling other people how great you are. You actually need um, someone in the form of a manager. Um, your mother's not good enough either. Um, it's got to be a, you know, a manager who can then tell a record uh, label, this guy or girl is going to be the next big thing. Um, and they can also deal with the business side of things to allow you as a musician um, to, to be creative. Yeah. Did you ever dream you'd be as successful as you are? No. I don't think so. I thought I would just be doing tours of North London. Um, so to be doing tours of the world has been amazing. But I think also that it's so, fame is a really strange thing. We don't talk about, we talk about fame, you know, you get famous and, and we don't really talk about what comes with being famous. It's, uh, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty miserable experience, if I'm totally honest about it, because all of your anonymity is stripped away. Again, I'm a guy who creeps around in bushes, n not being seen. Um, and, uh, and then to be spotted and seen, uh, but, but not just by the members of the public, but by members of the press. So when your phone is hacked, which mine has been, um, when your emails are hacked, which mine have been, when you have uh, photographers on your doorstep and people going through your bins, that, that side of fame is, uh, is a strange thing. So, so, so I would aspire to being a musician who was touring and doing that, but when I said famous musician, now I wish I just said jobbing musician instead of famous musician, perhaps. And do you have any particularly prominent, embarrassing celebrity memories? So times you've been uh, caught doing something wrong, or times that uh, they're your memories? <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, I don't think I should talk about them here. <laughs> I've had a few kiss and tells. Um, which have been uncomfortable. Um, I don't want to talk about them in here. <laughs> Just because, because the people, I think they were paid by the sun to go out and sleep with various celebrities, and I think I was last. <laughs> I think Rio Ferdinand was before me. <laughs> Maybe even Shane Warne, too. We should talk about something else. Sure. So, you're, <laughs> you spoke before about musical inspiration, uh, and one of the first things you did uh, on the rise to stardom in your musical career... I can tell you one other thing I should talk... I'm going to cut in. Go on, go on. I have to say, with this, I've got a relatively safe, uh, <clears throat> not celebrity faux pas, but my music's not exactly manly. Um, and so, uh, so I've taken to stage diving and crowd surfing, um, which makes me feel just like, like the rock star that I wanted to be. Um, and, uh, and I'd never really seen anyone do this. I've seen people crowd surf, but I've never seen the, the singer go. I never worked out the transition from stage to audience. So I had a bunch of people come, and my friends were all in the audience, and, and I was playing the piano, and, and I ran, and I jumped. The first six rows just parted, <laughs> like uh, Moses and, and the Red Sea. And, uh, and, and I managed to get my fingertips to the seventh row, just to, stop my, just to stop me being knocked out, really. Um, and all my friends had come to watch, and they just thought, oh, you're such an idiot. Um, and anyway, the next time I went and did it was in Asheville, North Carolina, where I jumped, and I just fell, and I broke my finger. <laughs> it's really broken. So when I hit the piano, when I got back, and I fought my way back onto stage, and I hit the piano, and I hit the wrong note. And, look, and then I said to my guitar technician, who hands me my fully tuned guitar um, before every song, I think I've broken my finger. And he said in his Glaswegian, well, you've got nine others. The next uh, stage diving moment I had was at Glastonbury, main stage, the pyramid stage. You know, this is, this is what dreams are made of. This is really the, ta the, 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 the most important moment in my musical career. 80,000 people watching and I'm playing, and the sun is shining, and I jump off, and I get on, and I'm crowd surfing over 80,000 people, and, and I'm, I am cool. <laughs> At that stage in my life, I am cool. And then I run back to the stage, and it's too high for me to climb up onto. <laughs> and I look at, at a guy, I don't recognize him, and he's on the stage, and I look into his eyes, and I say, help me, <laughs> help me. And I suddenly realize he's holding a camera, and he's the BBC TV cameraman. 
<laughs> and I'm just pleading with the nation to help me. And then I realized, no, I'm not cool. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. So when you first started your musical career, one of the things you did was um, toured with Elton John, or Sir Elton John, who today, very sadly, has announced um, that he will no longer be touring after 50 years of playing music. How did that come about? Because that's, that's quite a big first gig, to be playing with Sir Elton John. Yeah, and I slept my way to the top. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> um, uh, Elton, I really can't speak more highly of a human being, you know, because he's a man who's been in the press a lot and been given a lot of drip and a lot of grief um, just because he's been kind of, you know, tabloid fodder at different stages of his life. Um, but it's worth talking about a man who gave me the most serious leg up in my career. My first proper gig with my first ever band, I played to 50 people and, and you know, I think 49 of those were friends of mine. And the other, one, my other man was the sound man. Um, and the very next day, I played to 50,000 people um, in Ipswich Football Club, uh, as supporting Elton. And then he took me to tour around South America and to tour um, all of the UK as well. Um, and the opportunities um, were phenomenal. And, so, and I really think without him, I wouldn't have had that chance. But, but I had that chance because he started up a, a management, management firm called Rocket Music. And so there I was, looking for you know, my record deal, not getting my record deal, saying to these record companies, I want, you know, I, I want, to, uh, I want you to give me a record deal. And actually, it was a guy from Elton John's management firm who said, hey, you're doing this all wrong. You, know, you don't want to be saying you need a record deal. I'm a manager. I work for Elton John. And he has phenomenal managers who will you know, who'll, who'll do this for you. That man who literally I bumped into on the Portobello Road had been you know, given my demo CD then is still my manager now, um, and, and that was a company that's set up by Elton to look after new people and other people that are on it, you know, another dude you might have heard of called Ed Sheeran, um, and the likes of Dido have been on there, Elton himself, um, Lily Allen, um, and all of, all of us have had uh, our, our break, really, our leg up, a, a major part of it from Elton. So, yeah. So, on Ed, Sheer Ed Sheeran's the, the um, godfather of your child, isn't he? He is. Yeah, how was your relationship with Ed Sheeran like? Because there's a bit of a bromance going on. He's all right. <laughs> He's all right. He's doing pretty well, isn't he, too? Um, so, yeah, I, uh, we, we've, we've bonded over alcohol. Um, <laughs> And he, he's fun, you know. We, um, I've just been touring with him around uh, the States for three and a half months as his bitch. Um, <laughs> and it was good. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you are big fans of Ed's. I don't know, as a groupie of uh, his myself, or I would say is if you, are, if you find yourself in a bed with him, always make sure on the sides of the bed nearest the window, because he's up and down to the loo all night. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but we've had a pretty amazing uh, three and a half months touring the States. We had our mission uh, beforehand to eat 1,000 chicken wings. And I think in three and a half months, we probably did 500 each. So we reached 1,000. But that's why we both look very, very unwell. <laughs> yeah, what, what a perfect duo. Um, you spoke about touring a lot. Do you ever get bored of it? Do you ever get bored of singing You're Beautiful or Goodbye, My Lover? I get bored of that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Too easy. Uh, it's not the only song I sing every night. Yeah. Uh, but but no, I don't really. You know, I suppose I I'm you know I kind of make silly analogies. If I was a chef and you know and I, and lasagna was my my forte and everyone came to my restaurant for lasagna, then why would I get pissed off? By, 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 you know, making lasagna every night. If people are really happy about it, and they do seem to really like it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, what, what's, what's your type of music? Is, well, is your type of music the music you make? Definitely not. <laughs> 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 no. I live in, Ibi in Ibiza, and I, I love dance music. Um, and, and I have a nightclub at the end of my garden. Um, with a big neon sign that my band uh, made me. It says, Blunty's Nightclub, where everybody's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> and I have a mannequin on the door um, called Svetlana, which I bought from a mannequin shop, uh, which is quite weird, buying a mannequin from a mannequin shop, because they line them up uh, from cheap to expensive. 
and cheap's kind of plain and expensive's. She was really hot. <laughs> um, but I couldn't afford. Uh, and so I went just over midway, because you don't want to appear tight when you're buying a mannequin. Can anyone relate to this? Has anyone bought a mannequin? <laughs> no? So anyway, the first mannequin broke. Because um, I have some friends here, we have some nights back, and the first mannequin broke. So we buried her in, in a wedding dress, in a shallow grave, just in the forest outside my house. And I was hoping that someone's going to find her in 50 years and say, yeah, there was this weird dude who had a song. And, <laughs> and he's, he's dead now. Um, but uh, anyway, so now we've got Svetlana. She's more expensive. I still drive past the mannequin shop, because the, the, the hot one is... Anyway, <laughs> I miss her. We were talking about music. <laughs> but no, so I like dance music. Um, and, and, I, and so I have a club in Ibiza. I don't DJ so much because I have terrible taste in music. Uh, but but I, I like dance music. And so my biggest hit on my latest album is a song called OK. I wrote about 100 songs for this album uh, and spent, spent two years making it. And I wrote this song called OK. And it was, a, it was just okay. You know, I've gone from writing, you're beautiful, to just saying to a girl, uh, you know, it's okay. <laughs> and, so, and so I didn't like the song, and I had a big argument with my record label. They were saying, you know, this is a hit, this is great, it's so succinct and so perfect. You know, it's gonna be okay. Um, and, and I hated it, and I refused to put it on the album. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and we out this argument, and I thought, thank God for that, it's over, it's not on the album, and I will never hear this song again. And I bumped into this DJ called Robin Schultz in Ibiza, and he said, oh, hi, James, I've heard your song, okay, I love it, it's gonna be a hit, and I'm, and I'm, mix, and I'm re-recording it, and I'm mixing it, and he just took my recording and added a dance beat on it, and it's a socking great hit, all around, you know, all the places that would be you know, like Germany and Austria and Switzerland and France, and uh, the Australians will take it too. But anyway, now I can't escape this bloody song. <laughs> so yeah, so that's dance music is what I'm into though. Fantastic. Um, you're a big online Twitter personality. I think most people here will know about that. Uh, I mean, I was wondering if you could say a couple of words about your Twitter presence. Yeah, I would say, uh, I would say don't be on Twitter. Because um, it's just about egos um, and expressing and, and voicing your opinion. And, and why are we doing that nowadays? Why, are, why We were once told, keep your opinion to yourself. Um, or if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. And yet somehow, someone invented Twitter and, and now we're just really horrid to each other. Um, and I think it's really sad. And I really love it for the news element, but I find it really desperately sad for the, for the opinion element. Um, but you, you really, you give your opinion quite strongly on Twitter, don't you? <laughs> Do you I mean, can we hear some of your favorite tweets you've received? Yeah, go for it. Oh, you want me to? Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I only wrote them when I was drunk, so I can't remember. Do you want me to tell you? Um, what, it's, it's quite self-deprecating. I'm normally just horrid to myself about myself. Yeah. Because that's, that's easy. Things like, why is James Blunt not touring Scotland? Your reply, the Scots have taste. <laughs> um, can we take a minute to remember how terrible James Blunt was? Your reply, no need, I have a new album coming soon. <laughs> what, I mean, you must have some more that stick in your own memory. Yeah, I have, mine are normally terrible. Um, how, we're all of a normal age. An adult age, I write terrible things, and I do them when I, you know, when someone says James Bond's my guilty pleasure, I'll write, well, mine's anal. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, what is someone, yeah. What, what's the meanest you? Uh, someone said, you know, James Bond gets on my tits, this guy wrote, and I went, ah, oh, and finishes in your mouth. <laughs> 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 I mean, I just think, yeah, <laughs> it's just not worth doing, is it? Um, so yeah, it's a strange thing, and I, only, I don't go on it very often. I'm really embarrassed. This is a prestigious establishment. <laughs> I was really honored to be invited here, and I've really brought the level down, and I, and I apologize. And since you found yourself on Twitter, has the abuse gone up or has it gone down? It's totally disappeared. Really? 
yeah, I really have nothing. Scared. I have no material to work with yeah. anymore. I now ask friends to be rude to me. Because, <laughs> um, no, people don't seem to... And I think it's weird, again, because Twitter is... It's a digital uh, notice board, like you'd have here. You know, if, if you have a, the corridors here and someone can just put up so, something, you know, of their opinion. And, and why on the notice board in your, uh, in your hall would you then just put up something horrid about someone for so everyone else to walk past? And that's what, for me, Twitter is. And so it's just a stra strange old thing. And, um, and no, I'm, I'm not, I don't think it's a great invention in that way. Yeah. And you I do enjoy messing around on it. But you know what I also think is, I think it's not worth taking seriously because it's a digital world where there's a real world out there of things that are much more engaging where people are getting off their asses and, and doing stuff. And so I'm really, really lucky that I play concerts to, you know, to 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 in, in places with, with bad taste, Kazakhstan. Um, <laughs> and, and the people who come, who come to those concerts, um, as brave as they are, you know what, they've, they've, they've worked for their money to buy the ticket, and they've fought for those tickets in queues, and they've traveled some distance, and they've queued up in the rain, and they've come in there, and they've, you know, they've learned my songs, and they sing these songs with me. And, and, and why is it that, that you and I might focus on one or two or three maximum people uh, who, who write something negative? Because those people, they haven't made any effort or spent any money or traveled any distance. They're in their, their rooms, at home, online, probably with the curtains closed, maybe with their trousers around their ankles, <laughs> writing something nasty about someone they don't, they, you know, don't know. It's, and yet we take them seriously. We should laugh at ourselves, really, for, for, for even taking the time to find that tweet. Yeah. I think it's time now to open up to the floor. So does everyone run off? So if you have a question, just raise your hands uh, and wait for the mic to get to you. Yeah, sure. Can we, can we go straight to the front, if that's all right? Thanks very much for your talk. Um, you said earlier that your music isn't particularly manly. Is that a conscious decision um, alongside you and friends like Ed Sheeran and Jamie Lawson to kind of normalize a softer side to men? Yeah, you know, and I'm just saying so, aren't I? At the end of the day, um, I, I, I really love what I do, and I take it really seriously, um, and, and it pays my bills. So I don't mind it for that reason. Um, and that's why I don't mind singing the song every night, too. Uh, uh, but I think what I found when I was 14 as a man in England, an Englishman, is that it's quite hard to explain, you know, this weird thing that girls talk about called feelings. Um, and in a pub with my mates, I really don't want to talk about those things either. I just, you know, I want to talk about the, the football. Uh, and, and yet, you know, we as men, we do have these things called feelings too. And so I found it, I could get them out in songs. Uh, and, uh, and, and also, you know what, as a, as a soldier, my job was to have the eyes and ears of my commanders, to be really sensitive of the surroundings. And my friends would tell you, you know, I'm aware of what's going on around me. If, uh, you know, I'm good in a riot. Um, I can sense what's going on around me, that's my job. But as a, as a songwriter, um, that's my job too, to, to be sensitive to my uh, surroundings. Um, to be sensitive and report back to my, to my superiors, you know, you an audience. Um, I, 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 I see what's going on and I feel what's going on and I write a song about it and I capture it into words and, I, and, I, and then I, and I sing it out to um, my commanders um, out there in the audience. Um, and, and that's why some people, you know, connect with those songs. They say, yeah, you know what, I feel the same way. I struggle to put it into words, but I feel the same way. And, and I, I sing a song like Goodbye My Lover from my first album, and to me, it's, it's about, you know, this girl, she doesn't mean so much to me. I'm sure she's fine, whatever she's doing. Um, uh, I know where she lives too, by the way. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, but, but to some people, that song means much more to them. It means, uh, it's, it, for them, that song means someone who's died and things like that. And they will come and tell me, wow, that song means this, you know, when I watch my husband die of this. Um, and, and, and that connection with humans is something really special. And, and, and it's, it's where I do my job, really. And also, you know, I'm, I laugh about it all the time, but in, in, a, in a day and age where politicians tell us that we're all different um, and we should be afraid of everyone who's different from black and white and Muslim, Christian and Jew and men and women and gay and straight versus straight, we're all pitted against each other. And that's particularly what the politics of the world is today. Um, music brings complete strangers together into one room and they stand shoulder to shoulder, not giving a stuff what other religion is standing beside them, um, but connecting um, 
together with the same human emotion. Um, and that, for me, is why it's totally inspiring and why I totally love it and why I will do it every single night. Mm. Are all your songs based off real experiences? Because you wrote over 100 for the last album. Yeah, they are, definitely. I'm not all present and things. You know, I, I'm married now, um, and so I can't be continually writing miserable songs because um, she gets worried. But misery, <laughs> but misery sells. Uh, so, I have, so I do say to her, hey, you know, darling, I'm, I'm, this album, I'm going to write some really miserable songs, and I'm going to have to create some scenarios, but they're not about us. Um, can we go to the, the back, just by the window? He's got headphones, so I'm, that makes me nervous. That he's um, listening to your song, or...? <laughs> <laughs> Two short questions. Uh, one, does your uh, view of the standard Twitter user extend to President of America as well? And two... Sorry, just finish the first bit. My, does my... View of the average Twitter user extend to the President of America as well? And two, could you comment on the uh, This Is Belonging campaigns that the army have put out recently? I don't know if you've seen them, but I'd be, just be interested to hear what you think. Yeah, I think uh, Donald Trump is a genius on Twitter. I really genuinely do. I think, you know, I, I, uh, I despise his politics and everything to do with it. I think it's desperately sad um, where he, the path that he's taking us as a world uh, uh, in our politics. But I think he's a genius with it. Um, whether, whether he means to be or not is a different question. Um, and with the army, uh, what is it? Describe to people what exactly they're saying, because then I'll... Um, there's a series of ads which say this is belonging, and then it will be some sort of uh, minority position. So one of the particularly prominent ones is um, this is being gay, this is belonging, and it being a place in the army where you can be openly gay. Another is perhaps being a, a minority religion, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a big change, and lots of people from sort of the old army establishment have criticised it, so I'd be interested to know, you know... Yeah, I think our army has to be entirely welcoming to every single member of our, our society um, and, and care for them as much as they can. You know, when I joined, my best friend was gay um, and it was illeg actually illegal to be gay at the time in the army. Um, and it was an incredibly taxing time for him and, and all of us around him. Um, and then they changed the law uh, and said, okay, you know, it's, uh, it's illegal to have relationships within your chain of command, which makes much more sense, because then you're not going to cloud your working relationships with personal relationships, and that makes much more sense to me. Um, but I think, you know, uh, but everyone needs to be, it needs to be welcoming to all, um, it needs to look after all, but at the same time, I would put it with one proviso, which is, you know, you, you need your arm to, to be tough, um, and, and they, need to, they need to go out there and, and do, um, do the job. Which, um, which has no cushioning at the other end. And just while we're on the topic, you're involved extensively in, in Doctors Without Borders and Help for Heroes as a result of your time in Kosovo? Yeah. Um, I, when I was in Kosovo, uh, again, I, because I'm in reconnaissance, I was pushing ahead of, uh, of the main forces. Um, and and so I really thought I was doing a tough job. We, you know, we, we were at the forefront and we really thought we were the, the, the guys. And we would come around the corner and everywhere we went, we would bump into these men and women of the organization Doctors Without Borders, Medicines Sans Frontières. Uh, and, uh, and there they were, without protection, um, giving medical care and attention to the people who really suffer in war, which is not soldiers, it's civilians. Um, and they were totally inspiring people. Um, and, and if you ever hear their name, it's really worth learning more and, 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 uh, and donating if you can. Um, uh, and, and so, yeah, so when I now go out and do music, we raise funds for them because I think they're mind-blowing. And at the same time, I, uh, we raise funds for Help for Heroes and for wounded soldiers from my own regiment. But as I say, I think it's about a tenth, a tenth of your injuries in war are soldiers. Um, uh, the other 90% are civilians, so really, Doctors Without Borders are amazing. Yeah. Uh, can we just go to the back there? Hi. Um, what does your wife and family think of your music? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um, uh, do you know what? There are some songs that she loves, and there's some songs that she really doesn't like. Um, but normally, based on the subject matter, if there's, you know, if I have a song uh, about which she knows is about her, she's going to love it. Which songs are about her? 
Um, well, there's a song uh, called Postcards, which she always, always comes up and stands on the side of the stage because she knows it's for her, it's about writing a postcards, you know, because if you send a postcard, everyone on who passes the postcard onto its, um, uh, its intended recipients, they can read that message. And so it's about saying, I don't care what they read, that I love you. And that's a, a sweet little message. Whereas um, with my latest single I just put out, starts off with staring at you naked, hotel room in Vegas, and talks about, uh, um, you know, some twisted tryst. Um, and she goes, that one I don't like. <laughs> um, so pretty obvious stuff. Um, can we go just back there, about three rows from the back? Thanks. Hello, thank you for the speech. I was just wondering uh, a couple of questions. The first one is, what's your opinion on the renewal of uh, vinyl in the music industry, and do you think you'll get more involved with that in the future? And the second question is, ooh, um, I'd like to offer to buy you a beer later in the bar, if you've got the time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Let me deal with the most important question, the latter, yes, <laughs> um, definitely. Um, and yeah, vinyl's coming back, it's a strange old thing. Um, all my albums are now available for you. They, they, they were available on vinyl anyway, but we put them out on vinyl now, uh, and it's a fantastic thing to hold and feel. Um, and, uh, and I have all of them on vinyl, and I, and I don't have a record player. <laughs> uh, I, imagine, I wonder how many people are in the same position as me. Can we just go, yeah, to the third row here? No, it's you, yeah, to you, yeah, to you. You had your hand up. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I was wondering whether you're having any other collaborations like uh, with Marcus Schulz or any other um, dance music? I do, I do in February, but I'm not allowed to tell you. <laughs> Who but would yeah, be? it's another, it's, uh, yeah, another dance thing, another dance collaboration. Who would be your dream collaboration? I'd love to play with Jimi Hendrix, but <laughs> he's not answering my calls, so. And yeah, just the one behind you. Oh, you had your hand up before? Okay, yeah, just there. Hello, um, in several of your interviews, you've mentioned for this latest album, After Love, you wrote um, like 100 songs or over 100 songs. Are they kind of ones that you've written and went towards the making of the After Love but won't be seen again, or will you return to them and uh, develop them for future albums? Um, I ha yeah, having written 100 songs and put 10 on an album, that means I've got 90 lying around, and I, of course, you know, thinking now I must do a new album the record company is pushing me for as fast as possible, as they always do. I did go and revisit those 90, and they won't be coming out because they're all crap. <laughs> Can we just go to the front row? Hello, thank you for your songs. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is regarding your view about whether songs are like poems or poetry writing. Do you think you can do both at the same time as a musician? And the second question is regarding your uh, previous experience as being in the army. So if you're given another tank to go to a war, would you, would you go? and experience it again in a different period where we are truly going through a very difficult time. And um, say, you would, would you accept going to Afghanistan to serve in the army? Thank you. Um, uh, with uh, poetry versus songs, I think um, poetry is probably much harder because you've got a, you, it's, it's got to stand up on its own two feet just, as, just with words. But music, um, you can hear you know, a chord and it can give you an emotion. Um, so, so I think it, probably writing a song is easier than being a, an accomplished um, poet. Uh, but actually on songwriting, I would say that often I write songs with music and then I, and I put some words to it. But if I've written the words first and then I put the words to music, then it's gonna be a much better song. Um, and, and yeah, all of my biggest hits, I wrote the, the words first. Uh, uh, as to going to, um, if I was in it, would I go back to the army, almost is the question, and would I uh, agree to be sent out uh, on different things? Well, you, you know, the soldiers don't get to choose. Um, and uh, and, they're, they're, and they're, they're, that's, there's a good reason, because they'd all say no to most things. Um, but, uh, but even if you're being sent to the wrong war, 
I think sometimes potentially it's a good thing because the soldiers that I work with aren't politicians. Politicians normally have quite big egos. Politicians love to flex their muscles um, and, and use the weapons that they've got available to them. But really soldiers, they really genuinely, you know, they want to go, uh, whenever they've been sent to somewhere, they want to come back. Um, and so normally they will try and convince the opponent um, not to fight them. If you can convince them through sheer strength of will um, or, uh, and overpower them with the sense that they should be frightened of what you're going to deliver to them, they'll, um, they'll, they'll, they'll potentially not actually fight you, which is what, how most battles play out. Um, uh, so, so soldiers normally have a bit of common sense um, where, where politicians have more ego. And, and we spend a lot of time telling people to bugger off rather than fight them, and uh, and often they, they did so. Um, you know, I was really lucky. I was in Kosovo. I thought it was a, a, a good uh, a place to be sent simply because we were trying to stop the Albanians and the Kosovars, uh, Kosovans, uh, sorry, the Serbs and the Kosovo Albanians killing each other. Um, and if you saw two people trying to kill each other as a human being, it, it, it feels that you're duty bound to try and stop them in some way. And so I was very lucky to be sent there. Um, Afghanistan and Iraq, and Iraq seemed uh, likely that they were unnecessary, or at least um, I, don't, I, don't felt, I didn't feel, nor did my friends who were in the army, that it was the right place to be. And just on the topic of the importance of soldiers, uh, you claim that you stopped World War III, am I right? No, I didn't say that. The BBC said that. <laughs> and everything um, they say is... Uh, <laughs> um, that was... A, uh, Whatever you read in a paper, the, the, the title, uh, the, the, the headline rather, is made up by an editor. So the text is, is made, you know, written by a journalist. Um, and, uh, and what you read um, in the headline is made up by the, the, the editor. Um, that's to be sensationalized in order to make you read it. Um, but yeah, the, but I'll tell you my story about the day. It was the most amazing day of my life. Um, as, a, as, as a reconnaissance officer, we'd uh, observed, we'd, uh, we'd bombed, we then got them to sign a peace accord, and then I was uh, told that I had to lead 30,000 soldiers um, in a big column from Macedonia across the border of Kosovo and up to Pristina, uh, the capital, and we were racing the Russians. A Russian contingent, we were told, of 200 Russians were coming, uh, uh, and they were being allowed in by the Serbs, because the Serbs and the Russians get on, and they were going to try and beat us to the airport in Pristina. Whoever controls the airport uh, controls the logistics of supply and basically has control of the land. So we had to beat the 200 Russians. There were 30,000 of us, 200 of them, um, and, and I was the very front man, which is quite high pressure. If you've got 30,000 people following, you know, I'm sure you've had driven in your cars, you're heading to a party, you've got five people following, and you're thinking, I mustn't, <laughs> mustn't make the wrong turn, because convincing five people to turn around down a... Well, imagine that with 30,000 people. Yeah, you want to make sure you, you get the right place. And anyway, so when I was minefields, and I was being told, you know, just cross the minefield and go, and, and the first soldier will, first tank will blow up, and then we'll just overtake him. It's seriously high pressure and being watched by Sky News and the BBC and mm. all these other uh, things. Anyway, we got there, um, and the Russians had beaten us. Um, and so we had a... Uh, they were there, lined up 200 Russians, a Mexican standoff um, of them lined up saying, you're not coming on, and us saying, we are coming on, 30,000 of us, and they're saying, no, you're not. And General Wesley Clark was our supreme commander. And uh, he actually ran for president um, uh, after that, which is not surprising. He was giving me the instruction to overrun and overpower 200 Russians, which seems an amazing instruction because there seems to be some kind of consequence to, um, to that. Overrun and overpower, saying, what does, but surely that we, that's not... That's not military speak. We need, uh, you know, that the word is destroy because it means the same thing. Um, and so anyway, we had an argument for, you know, for five minutes or so, um, uh, being told to overrun and overpower 200 Russians. And uh, after five minutes, an amazing uh, general called General Mike Jackson, he's the guy with the phenomenal bags under his eyes, uh, came up on the radio and he said, stop this madness. I'm not having my soldiers being responsible for starting World War III. And he told us to pull back and surround uh, the airport. And we surrounded it. And two days later, the Russians had run out of food and water. And so they said, they came up and said, can we have food and water? And we said, sure, we'll share our food and water if you share the airport. So World War III was averted. General Mike Jackson averted it. And James Blunt was here.
<laughs> um, can we go to the second row? Just say, just play the piano. Thanks. Hi. I'm a big fan of your music, um, and my girlfriend here often gives me a lot of stick about Aww. it. Um, I'm so glad to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I've, been, I've been looking for you forever. I'm here. I'm here. How do you we, we're going to the bar after you and me, yeah? Put drinks on him. Can I right have your there. phone number? <laughs> Just for when I have new music? Yeah. Um, Go on. Say, how should I best deal with that kind of thing? <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't, I can't help you. Can you not relate to this at all? Do you like, because... I know, I've never met anyone with your problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think you're phenomenally brave. You could be in the army too. Okay. Um, I'm so grateful to you. And, you know, and keep flying that flag. I will. Thanks very much. <laughs> Are there any questions up? Yeah, can we go to the, t to the top left? Is there, is there a steward in the top left? Oh, there's, I think there's someone with the mic. There's someone with, okay, a shout. We can shout. hear you. Come on. Thank you for coming to Wisdom a few years ago, though. I thought you were advising a similar trans gender thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to send a rider to your room, what would your one hour decision take them? Um, I, yeah, interesting. I would probably, uh, I, I like, I'd probably take something miserable because I was on a <laughs> desert island. Um, so there's an album uh, called You Are Free by Cat Power, which is, which is the kind of indie album. And when, I f uh, and when I first got a record deal, that's who I went and saw immediately after. And it was really desperately raw and sad music, but I found it very inspiring for, for my first album. And one final question. Um, can we go just set to the third row? Is it all right for the mic? Because then it comes up on, on YouTube. If you're taking requests for music, could you possibly play 1973? Sweet, but I've forgotten how to play it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that incredible note, you may have noticed, uh, we do have a piano, and we do have a very, very famous musician with us. Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, very kindly he's agreed to perform for us tonight. So yeah, so I'm... Can you hear me? Is that going to work? So yeah, you know, usually in these kind of scenarios, musicians say, hey, I'm going to play you something, you know, from my new album. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I got on the stage uh, recently with Jonathan Ross playing, and he said, Grant, just play your hit and fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll play, I'm just going to play two from, uh, from my first album, because, yeah, I know that. Did I disappoint you or let you down? Should I be feeling guilty or let the judges frown? Cause I saw the end before we'd begun. Yes, I saw you were blinded and I knew I had one. So I took what's mine by eternal right took your soul out into the night it may be over but it won't stop there I am here for you if you'd only even care you touched my heart you touched my soul you changed my life and all my goals and love is blind and that I knew when my heart was blinded by you I've kissed your lips and held your head shared your dreams and shared your bed I know you well I know your smell I've been addicted to you goodbye my lover goodbye my friend you have been the one 
Though I've been the one for me Goodbye, my lover Goodbye, my friend You have been the one You have been the one for me I am a dreamer And when I wake you can't break my spirit It's my dreams you take And as you move on Remember me Remember us and all we used to be I've seen you cry, I've seen you smile I've watched you sleeping for a while I'd be the father of your child I'd spend a lifetime with you, I know your fears, and you know mine. We've had our doubts, but now we're fine, and I love you, I swear that's true. I cannot live without you. Goodbye, my lover. Goodbye, my friend. You have been the one. You have been the one for me. So yeah, so we're ending on a happy one, <laughs> or not? Okay, let me just sort myself out. You know the song, <laughs> and you think it's a romantic song, <laughs> but it's not. So yeah, I mean, it, I do find it kind of weird because this song is played at um, played at people's weddings and stuff, uh, and and they and people go, oh, you know, James Bond, he's this really nice, soft, delicate human being, um, and a romantic at that. And people, they always ask me, so you must be a romantic, you know, like what did you do for your, your wife on Valentine's Day? And I always say, oh yeah, you know, I, I hired a helicopter and I flew her over to the house and I dropped a hundred thousand red rose petals over the house and then I picked her up and we flew to Paris and. And she's really annoyed by that, because she knows it's bullshit. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I, I normally forget Valentine's Day. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. So anyway, the history of this song really is not that romantic. It's, a, it's about a guy, me, high as a kite on drugs, <laughs> uh, uh, stalking someone else's girlfriend on the, on the subway in London. Um, and, 
And, and he was there, the boyfriend, obviously, he was there. He's a much bigger man than me. And I, I should have been arrested just for my own safety. So, so dramatic. You can hear that? My life is brilliant My life is brilliant My love is pure I saw an angel Of that I'm sure She smiled at me on the subway She was with another man but I won't lose no sleep on that Cause I've got a plan You're beautiful You're beautiful You're beautiful It's true I saw your face In a crowded place And I don't know what to do Cause I'll never be with you Yes, she caught my eye As we walked on by She could see from my face That I was fucking high And I don't think that I'll see her again But we shared a moment That will last to the end You're beautiful You're beautiful You're beautiful It's true I saw your face In a crowded place and I don't know what to do Cause I'll never be with you La la da La la da La la da da You're beautiful You're beautiful you're beautiful, it's true There must be an angel With a smile on her face When she thought of that I should be with you But it's time to face the truth I will never be with you. Thank you so much for that. Here we go.